One. This all happened around 15 years ago, though I still remember it pretty vividly. I had just started a new job at a shady, shitty company. I was one of only two IT guys for the whole enterprise. The company decides to fly me out to Baltimore, Maryland, to help them set up a new store's POS system and troubleshoot other assorted issues on site. I was in my early 20s and honestly, I hadn't done a great deal of travelling on my own without friends or family, career or otherwise. I had never been to Maryland, and although I was curious, I was also quite nervous about the trip for some reason. So I arrive in Maryland with instructions to meet a person at the airport, who would take me to the hotel and then to the job site. After a few tense moments, I find the gentleman in question and follow him to his truck. I was sandwiched between him and a pasty white younger guy with really long dreadlocks, probably the first white dude with dreadlocks I'd ever met, for an hour-long ride in almost complete silence. I had no idea where we were headed exactly, which probably wasn't very smart, but I was naive and trusted these gentlemen not to chop me into pieces and eat me. As we approached the job site, I started to feel a little odd. It's hard to describe, and I've never really felt it again, but it was like I was getting a fuzzy series of visions in my mind's eye, and they were becoming more and more prominent as the ride got closer to its destination. They felt like a combination of still frame shots and motion shots. They started off barely noticeable, and as we got nearer, I was convinced that someone somewhere was trying to tell me something or send me a heads up. The first visions involved a group of young girls in their early twenties. The mood of the vision was very tropical, warm and happy. I felt, because that's the best word for it, that these girls were on a cruise liner in the Caribbean, somewhere enjoying the sun on the pool deck. One of the girls in the vision, I felt like she was standing right in front of me, walking towards me with the other girls behind her. In my vision, she had these thick, nerdy-type glasses, long, wavy, dirty blonde hair, and a bikini top with a bright pink border and colorful horizontal stripes. Jesus, I can still see the image in my mind. Then come the second visions. A girl in her early twenties, attractive, very white, long blonde hair, a kind smile and very unique eyes. It wasn't the color. It was the fact that in the vision her lower eyelids were very prominent, almost like she had bags, but it was just how her eyes naturally were. In the vision she was looking over her left shoulder at me. There was no specific frequency to how often the visions hit me. They were intermingled, and I just kept drawing my attention to them and thinking, why in the world am I getting this? So we get to the storefront, and as I enter, who do I see? The freaking girl from my first vision, standing right in front of me, glasses and all. She's an employee of the store, and part of the team helping set up for opening day. Needless to say, I was flabbergasted. I soldiered along and got all my tasks done, but I must have interrupted her twenty-odd times, asking her if we had ever met, or if she had ever been on a cruise. She took it all very graciously, although I'm sure she thought I was nuts. We finally agreed that, no, we had absolutely never met before that day, and no, she had never been on a cruise, but she admitted that she, her family, and close friends were booked to embark on a multi-day Caribbean cruise in a few months. She wasn't sure about going. I admitted to her that for some reason I had been having visions of her specifically on a cruise, and that I wasn't 100% sure, but I felt like she should definitely go. I left out the bikini colored part to avoid making things weirder. A few hours into it, and the second vision starts nagging me. And wouldn't you know it, I turn the goddamn corner and there she is, the blonde twenty-something girl with the baggy eyes. She's friends with the first girl. I'm convinced I've lost my mind at this point. I'm wondering what twilight zone have I stepped into. I spoke with the blonde girl for a moment, and kept things friendly, but I didn't mention the visions. I couldn't stop looking at her eyes though, 
and I know she caught me looking several times throughout the day. The day continues and the work proceeds, girl one and I keep laughing about the cruise. Then I get another premonition, message, whatever. It's persistent and strong, but it wasn't a vision. The whatever revolved around the word, concept, phrase, German. It was like German, Germany, speaking German, German language, etc. Over and over again, I had no clue, so I kept it to myself. It must have lasted just under an hour. Then I hear it. Girl number one starts up a conversation with one of the guys doing the heavy lifting, about where they're from. She admits her family is of German descent, and speaks German fluently, then she demonstrates for him. I swear in all that is holy and otherwise, that up to that point in the day not a soul had mentioned the word concept, country, or language German. I listen to her speak, and then I walk away laughing to myself quietly. Convinced I had lost my damn mind. The rest of the trip was uneventful. I stayed in whatever town it was for a few more days, wrapped up my assignments, and headed home. I should have made an attempt to keep in touch with the girls, but... The events that had unfolded were weird enough as they were. I can still recall the events very clearly. Sadly, since then, I have never felt anything as strong or as clear as that again. It was odd for sure, but it was strangely satisfying. 2. About 20 years ago, I was reading a very local paper. This tiny little publication that only covers my hometown of about 2,500 people. I came to the obituaries, and there is an obit with a picture of an acquaintance I'll call Jamie. Jamie and I had known each other from toddlerhood, but she was a hard person to get your head around and kept to herself. She wasn't mentally ill or weird, but just so closed you could know her a lifetime and never know anything about her. This was the case with me. After we left school, I had no further contact with her. There was no suggestion of how she died in the listing, and we were only 25 or so at the time. Unfortunately, I never paid any attention to the funeral details because we weren't close enough for me to attend. The unmentioned death of a young person in a small community is remarkable. But I put it down to how she was an individual, her lack of a social circle. Another of our friends died in a pretty awful way not long before, and within hours the whole town knew, which compounded this odd sense of why isn't anyone talking about this? A couple of weeks later, Jamie's first cousin died in a way that garnered national attention. Can't say much about this because it was a unique event that would give away identifying info. Everyone was talking about it. An older friend and I were discussing the cousin's death and I said, What a blow it was, given the family had just lost Jamie so recently. The friend said, I hadn't heard she died. I told her when it was, and about the obit. My friend was puzzled too. Jamie sometimes wandered past my friend's mother-in-law's house, but she couldn't recall seeing her in a while. Frustratingly, I had no way to check this with anyone. Jamie's odd lifestyle meant that neither I nor anyone I knew even had mutual friends with her, let alone had actually interacted with her. Her family were grieving, and I didn't know any of them beyond sight, so I was hardly going to approach them. I decided to try and find the paper, at the very least, to show my friend. I got back copies. Nothing. My memory of the obit was, and is, vivid, down to the arrangement of the text, the position of the page, typefast, and the photograph. The photograph stuck out too, because at the time, locally, was an uncommon inclusion in obituaries, usually reserved for the important or famous. This remained a mystery till quite recently, when she appeared on TV news on a vox pop with two kids in tow. After this, I seriously considered seeking psychiatric help. I have questioned my sanity a lot over this event, but I've never found an explanation that is satisfactory. For the record, Jamie's name is unusual and distinctively spelled, and the photo makes misidentification unlikely. Her birthday is the day before mine, so I always remembered it. 3. 
Okay, so this happened about an hour ago, and I'm sat here very confused and a little freaked out. I'll try and describe this accurately. I have a little sister who has her closest friend round our house, maybe five nights a week. Best friend's dad almost always picks her up, and when he does, he usually stops in for a chat or a drink with my parents or myself. This has happened regularly for the past year and a half to two years. Lovely guy, has occasionally spent a few hours every now and then for drinks and such around holidays. So a few weeks ago and my laptop breaks. I know that it's going to cost a fair bit to fix, but I remember this guy who fixes all kinds of tech. I find him on Facebook through my sister and think, huh, weird, that profile picture doesn't look like him. But didn't think too much of it, even assumed that it could have been a celebrity or something. I message him anyway and he agrees to fix my laptop for me, and that he'd pick it up the next time he picked his daughter up from ours. Fast forward to today. I'm sat in my room which overlooks the road. I hear the front door knock and as I usually do, I poke my head out of the window to see who it is. I have no idea, so sit back down as someone downstairs will no doubt answer the door. After a few minutes my sister knocks on my bedroom door and tells me that her friend's dad is here and needs my laptop. Confused, I pack it up and head downstairs. He is standing in the hallway and as I say hello, I begin to freak out a little. I have never met this guy in my life. I try to keep calm and explain about my laptop, as he seems to know me, but I am so confused. This is not the same man I have met many times. Completely different build, face, hair, voice, everything. I continue talking to the guy and making small talk as his daughter gets ready to go and I suggest to myself that maybe she has a stepdad and I have only met one of the two before. This whole time I feel really embarrassed and uncomfortable as I have asked this man I have never met to fix my PC for me, like I would a friend. After they leave, I go straight to my sister and say something like, Hey, what the fuck, does your friend have a stepdad? I'm really confused. My sister thinks I'm absolutely crazy, and assures me that this was the man I have met countless times, and that there is no one else it could be. I freak her out considerably, and by this point I'm just sure I'm going crazy. There is no way I just have it mixed up. These are two completely different men, with no similarity between them in looks or character. Not sure what's happening or what's going on, but that's what happened. Four. I work in a call center for a bank. It's not glamorous work, but it pays the bills. Recently I received a call early in the morning at about 8 a.m., from a man I'll call Tom. Tom shares a checking account with a woman named Lynn. He told me they're not married, though, so I assume they're at least good friends. Tom wanted to check over the transactions on his account and to know his account balance. He asked for the clear checks first and requested I list the amounts only, not check the numbers. After which he advised me that those were all the checks he had written and was not expecting any more to be presented. He then asked for me to list the other transactions, and so I do. He stops me when I get to one particular transaction, which happened to be at an ATM outside of our bank network, and therefore had an extra dollar amount attached to the amount that had been requested to be withdrawn. He inquires as to why there's an extra dollar amount, and I explain that it was due to the ATM owner assessing their own fee. He also wanted to know where it had taken place. I told him that it happened in Hawaii. Apparently this is where Lynn was, so we then carried on with the other transactions on his account. Now none of this is strange or unusual, admittedly. I have this call type multiple times a day. I notate the account and close the call appropriately and go on with my day. Two hours later I answer the phone and it's Tom again. He started the conversation the exact same way he had before, asking for the cleared checks by the amounts only. 
He again advised that those were all his checks and didn't expect more to be presented. Then he asked me to list all of the other transactions, so I started to do that. When I came to the ATM transaction from Hawaii, I thought that there was surely no way he would need me to explain it again. But lo and behold, he sure did. It was like the whole conversation had been completely duplicated, down to the letter. A little nervous with goosebumps on my flesh, I cautiously asked him if I had not fully explained things to his satisfaction when he called earlier. And did he need me to go over anything again? Tom said, a little surprised, that no, he didn't need me to go over anything again, but he hadn't called earlier. Not wanting to press the issue further, I closed the call again and went to notate the account. And there were my previous notes from the earlier conversation. Now I realize I take the same call types over and over, and sometimes it can make me feel like I'm stuck on repeat. But Tom has a very distinct voice and manner of speaking. Plus, the way he asked for the transactions to be read, in the order he asked for them, and specifically the details I had to give about the Hawaiian ATM fee, it truly was the exact same call. I would say maybe he was having a stroke or had some type of short-term memory loss. But the notes from his calls from other days with other representatives didn't lead me to believe this is something that had happened before. And since then I've checked his account and nothing since then makes me think it's happened again. Plus he outright denied the first call even took place, so... Glitch? What do you think? 5. To clarify up front, I've never heard of Mandela Effect until late last year, and never paid any attention to it until after Prince died, and people who don't know any better insisted he never said, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate this thing called life. And I insisted he most certainly did. I danced to that song constantly, and enough repetition, you know what the lyrics are. I can write them out right here and now without googling it. That's how ingrained it is. And that's how I ended up discovering Mandela Effect was a thing. I've heard it linked with the butterfly effect in some circles, so I have to lean in that direction as the first real effect that stopped me cold. Skeptics will just wave it off as a faulty memory I just forgot. I don't care because I know better. That's not what took place, for the record. I'm a militant atheist, no spooks, ghosts, angels or demons. I'm a creature of habit. My home is my sanctuary. I know where everything is. My home is always clean and tidy. I have spots where things go, that end up spots where things go out of natural habit. I don't choose spots as much as let them reveal themselves organically in the situation. For example, I put groceries away the same way all the time. I put canned drinks on the lowest shelf in the door. I put all breakfast stuff and milk, butter, jellies on the top shelf. I put lunch and snacks on the middle shelf. I put leftovers on the shelf over the vegetable fruit bins. I walk to the door and do not put my purse on a table. I carry it to where I usually sit, be it sofa or easy chair, and put it on the floor. My dental products always go on the left side of the sink in the back by the hot water knob always on the left side. I turn the toilet paper flap over the top, not under the roll. My coffee cup is set down the same way, with the handle pointing the same way, so I grab it with my right hand. Point being, I'm OCD about how shit is placed, and where it's placed in my house. I want to know where everything is. I have always been this way. I do not lose anything or misplace it in my house. I might leave my keys on the counter at the store, but I have never lost anything placed in its spot in my house. The only time the spots change is when I have moved somewhere new, with a different lay of the land. But I let it fall into place, and that's how it remains for the duration. This is not to be confused with the dozens of times I go hunting, all over the house for my reading glasses, and an hour later figure out they're hanging off my collar or on my head. Don't start. Clear? I lived in a townhome for a while where the kitchen was right off the front door. When I come in after using my keys to unlock the door, 
I'd put the keys on the counter next to a divider wall, next to a bowl with loose change. Always. Then I'd set the groceries down on the same counter and bring it all in, then put it away. One afternoon I came in from a trip, specifically to get bread because I was out. I put the keys down and put the bread on top of the fridge, where it's always been put, forever and ever. The next morning I got a call to go pick up a friend. I agreed but fell asleep and ended up being late, and getting called back. I jumped up and got it together, got dressed, etc., and ran downstairs, reached around the divider wall for my keys that were not there. What the fuck, where are my keys? I went on a full-scale massive search in every single room in my house. I went outside and checked to make sure they weren't still in the car, or on the ground, or in the front door. They were nowhere to be found. I stood there staring at the spot where the keys always were, and it's empty. Just utterly dumbfounded as to where the hell they were. I was freaking out because I need my keys. My friend called back and I apologized but wasn't able to go pick them up till I figured out where my car keys were. The entire day passed. I looked two or three more times and then it became the principle of the thing. Where the hell were my damn keys? What the fuck? I literally felt helpless and confused. Like my entire way of life was yanked inside out over some keys. I looked in every closet. I checked all the doors and windows, going so far as asking my neighbors if they saw anybody going into or coming out of my place. I spent that night constantly looking out various windows for vantage spots and making sure nobody stole my car. The next day, still tripping over it, when I went down to make coffee, the goddamn bread is gone. Not kidding. I know I went to the store, I know I put it on the fridge. And I was settled and confirmed clearly this was the case, because the store sack was in the trash where I put it, and the receipt was in my purse. So what? Is somebody sneaking in here, stealing my keys and bread? Am I being pranked? Is a creepy person living in the attic? What the fuck? I wasn't scared or paranoid overall. Mostly tripping and utterly baffled. I went back out to the car just to make sure I didn't leave the bread in it, and... Nope. I walked back in to grab my coffee, and my keys are sitting right there on the counter where they always were. Not kidding, but when I picked them up, I noticed my keychain was not the same one. I had three charm things. A little silver scorpion, an acrylic rectangular funny quote meme thing and an alien head from Roswell. The scorpion that I bought sober and of sound mind was no longer silver but black. A shiny black metallic finish. I knew in that moment what it feels like to completely lose your entire sense of reality. And what I always knew I knew. This is not possible. This is not right. I know once again. I know what my keychain looked like. I held it daily. I wouldn't have even bought a black metal scorpion. It was silver. No explanation, no resolution. I have asked everyone, every single person that I interacted with at the time, and every single one of them that even briefly noticed my keychain, all told me it was silver. Because it was. It's Mandela effect in that every person I asked that remembered it, did so as silver and were just as baffled as I was that it was black metal. I have no other explanation that's digestible as to why an entire day passed with me frantically looking for them, and the next morning they're on the counter where the keys always were, with a different keychain charm. None. For the record, the bread never returned. I'm still dumbfounded by this event. I had a few others that knocked me back a few bit, this was the first real moment that I started questioning the nature of reality all over again. Then I watched Butterfly Effect and, well, that just made it worse. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Glitch in the Matrix Stories, episode 36. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I don't know if I mentioned last week, but the story I had to push back because of the content... Uh, I haven't used that in this week's video, 
I'm going to push that back a few more weeks, maybe a month or so, we'll see. Uh, just because it involves kind of premonitions about bad things happening and that sort of thing. And uh, given the climate right now, it's it's not a good idea. It'd be quite rude and considered to use that in a glitch video at the moment. Uh, but I will use it. It's there, it's done, it's recorded, it's good to go. But I'll just, I'll wait till things are calmer and the timing's right. And I'll put that in a glitch video somewhere down the line. Okay, and with that I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.